And so there is that, but um, that's true with any issue. Uh, but uh, we're living in a day and age where uh, if you don't agree and affirm, then you are a hate monger, a homophobe. Uh, there's no reasoning. The moment they see that you don't affirm them, then you're the enemy. And so that come now, let us reason together that God says is out the window. Are we on, Charles? Okay. All right. Well, well once again, welcome, everyone. Um, today is kind of a continuation of yesterday going a little bit farther. And um, I'm glad that you're all here. And let's pray that God will really bless. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to delve into your word. Uh, this uh, weekend so far has been a tremendous blessing to me, and I pray that you will use me to continue that blessing to others here. As we look at your word, Lord, please open our hearts and our minds. We are by nature fallen. We are stiff-necked and hard-hearted and resistant. By nature, we just resist. Uh, we need your spirit to open our hearts and to be softened. Uh, to receive your word and your message for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay, just a short introduction for those of you who were not here yesterday. Uh, Coming Out Ministries organized uh, 10 years, uh, 12 years ago. We have, uh, we were reclaiming, talking about reclaiming, we were reclaiming the term coming out, mm -hmm. coming out of the closet, gay and proud, we're reclaiming that biblically because one of our very special texts of Scripture in Revelation 18, the angel there is the message has come out of her, my people. Absolutely. And this really applies to the gay community too because God loves gay people. Uh, he is homo agopic. He is not homophobic. Uh, I know he loves gay people because I was one and he loved me enough to draw me out and show me the way. And it was through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy alone that I found all of my answers. I didn't need therapy. I didn't need counseling. I need a savior from sin. And when I acknowledged that my issue was a sin issue, everything fell into place. I applied God's remedy for sin to my sin issue. I stopped claiming an acceptable alternative lifestyle. I stopped blaming God for making me this way and for being born this way. I stopped believing once gay, always gay, because as an Adventist, we don't believe once saved, always saved. Why do we believe once anything, always the same? That eliminates the power of choice. So uh, God is calling gay people out of the confusion, the Babylon confusion that is surrounding this issue. And talk about confusion. When you have now children as young as four years old, the age I was when I was sexually molested, which derailed me um, for life until I found the answers when I was 40. I was derailed at four and re-railed at 40. How about that? Um, at that age, these children are being taught in public school. To act, um, they're being introduced to homosexuality, uh, to transgenderism, to all of these things. The public school system is now sexually abusing an entire generation of children the way I was sexually abused at the age of four. Um, because they are even teaching methodology to these children. In some places, they let the children go into a private room and experiment and practice and all this kind of stuff. It's horrible what is happening. Uh, God loves these children. God loves these people. And he's calling them out of Babylon too. So come out of her, my people, is a, a part of our message. It is our message. Um, and then in 1 Peter 2, 9... Uh, we are talking about being called out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the text that we use with our logo, out of darkness into light. But then there's the passage in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18 that talks about, uh, that urges us to come out from among them and be ye separate. And you can plug in the them. I mean, we, we know what the them is. So our name is biblical. We chose a... We are redeeming a, a term and making, I mean, we're redeeming it biblically. And just like we 
we like to think we are reclaiming the rainbow uh, and that type of thing. Um, the, the study today is entitled, Yet Without Sin, or Even As I Also Overcame. I can't make up my mind which title to use. <laughs> so I use them both. <laughs> um, I first was introduced to the 1888 message shortly after coming into the Adventist faith um, 30 years ago. I don't think, actually, I think I was still in the independent ministry mode. I was baptized through the independent ministries, thinking of them as self-supporting workers. I kind of grew up in that, that environment at Madison Academy and Madison College. My dad was hired to run the dairy at Madison College. And then I went to Little Creek Academy, an independent, I mean, a self-supporting self academy that was very musical. And I was musical, and that's where I really uh, got launched into music and uh, primarily, a lot of my ministry today is concert music, uh, music with my grand concert grand marimba um, that I learned in academy. Um, but I, I grew up with this self-supporting um, mentality. I, I really enjoyed that. So when I was baptized into the faith, it was through independent ministries because what I heard them preaching was straight Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. But there was a spirit of separation in there that I did not detect at first. Five years I was in that environment, traveling around, you know, internationally with one of the key uh, leaders in that, in that field. Um, but then as he started preaching, come out of her, my people, and applying it to the Adventist church, I said, wait a minute, that's not our message. And I started studying, and then I found in testimonies, I just saw the quote the other day about uh, our obligation to have our names on the church rolls, and I said, whoops, I haven't done that. I've been baptized, but I've not become a member. And so I um, uh, took the steps to actually become a member, and then the true spirit of separation revealed its ugly head, and I was ostracized, I was slandered, I was accused of everything you can imagine. I was even accused of being a Jesuit, <laughs> working in the independent ministries to bring people back into the church. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I feel an article coming on, the Confessions of a Jesuit. <laughs> she said, don't you do it. I said, oh, I can hardly help myself. In the article, I will talk about my life in the gay world, all the things I did. I was from, from morning to morning because I, I closed the nightclubs at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was a dancer and a dance instructor. I was a bartender. I was all those things. And then, you know, I was involved in hang gliding and biking and inline skating. And, of course, there was work involved, all of these different things. And then in the article, I was going to put, and in my spare time... <laughs> I took an online course from Georgetown University in Jesuit infiltration. And, and the whole thing was going to be a spoof. And Claudia said, don't you dare. They'll believe it. <laughs> and you will confirm them in their accusations. But anyway, uh, I think I was still in that mode when I went to the 1888 conference up in Berrien Springs. Uh, Dr. Whelan and Short were still there and some others, uh, names that you would all probably remember, of course, but um, that was my introduction. While I was there, there was a professor from the seminary who was also there, and he was not there to learn. He was there to gather information. <laughs> He turned out, he was a fellow that dated a girl I grew up with and almost married her, so I felt like we were kind of related. You know, we knew each other. We were from the South and all that. And so we got acquainted, and he invited me to his office and, um, to, to have discussion. And we had like a Nicodemus night. I mean, we were there till way uh, after midnight talking. And, and he said, you know, I'm writing this new book, and it's all about the nature of Christ. I said, oh, really? I've been studying that. And he said, well, here, I'll print out a copy for you of the manuscript. And he printed this out. And, uh, but as, as it was printing out, he's telling me. And I'm thinking, that guy's wrong. He's, he doesn't have it right. Um, and finally, I said, you know, 
I almost said his name. I said, you know, if you had come to me with this understanding where I was just a few years ago, I would never have accepted Jesus. He says, well, what do you mean? And I quoted Hebrews 4. Jesus was tempted in all points like as me, yet without sin. He said, yeah. Amen. So what's wrong with that? And I told him where I came from, and he drew back. <laughs> I mean, he visibly did this. He said, uh, you don't mean to think Jesus was tempted like that, do you? That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I said, now, so-and-so, how do you believe Jesus was tempted? Like you? Perhaps I find that disgusting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm not going to try to imagine every thought that was planted in his head and every temptation but don't take this text away from me. I read this text and it tells me that he understands me, he understands my feelings, my emotions, my struggles. And in Hebrews 2, he suffered being tempted. He understands a struggle and all of that. And I said, um, don't, don't take this text away from me. By the end of the evening, he was saying, you know, Ron, our church needs an exhibit A. And I said, I don't want to be anybody's exhibit. <laughs> He said, we need material on this issue. We don't have anything about this in the church and all that. And I said, uh, I don't want to be anybody's exhibit. Well, it was right after that, someone from the review came and asked me to write my story, to publish my story. And then um, I, I eventually did that. And then it was actually published outside the denomination because the book committee wouldn't allow the review to even publish the story because they didn't want this guy who invited me to write it. He said they didn't want to put R-H on that subject. So we put H-H on it. Huntington House. I went to a non-Adventist publisher that did current events and you know things like that. And uh, they were religious. Uh, they're the ones who published the book by the... Oh, I just slipped my name. The, the, the pilot that was arrested for drug dealing and ended up years in prison and he came out. I forgot his name all of a sudden. But I just went to my bookcase and pulled out a book and there and it was his and there was a publisher and I sent it off and, and in three months my book was published and ready for the general conference session. They sold it back to the review because uh, the review wanted to publish it but the book committee, advisory committee, wouldn't allow it. And so then it was introduced. But... Um, after that, I was asked to, uh, uh, to go on, well, to create a website to go along with my book and to use a pen name for my protection. That's why my first books use the author name of Victor J. Adamson because I needed a pen name for my protection, according to the publisher. I took longer coming up with a pen name than, than writing the book, literally. Mm -hmm. I wanted a message in the name, Victor J. Adamson, and I was... Um, contracted for two or three years to be on radio talk shows all around the nation talking about my experience. And how affirming is that when everyone is talking to you on the radio as a victor? Victor this and victor that and all of that. So that's one reason I chose the name. But then uh, by doing that, then Sean Boonster came to me and said, someone gave me your book, I read your book, are you ready for television? I said, no. <laughs> I, I was still trying to be incognito and anonymous. I was writing under a pen name and I submitted my testimony to a, a global publication and they contacted me and said, uh, because I didn't even put the pen name on that, and they said, Ron, we, you didn't put... Um, no, they didn't say Ron. They said, you didn't put your name on this testimony. We'd like to publish it, but we need, we need your name and a picture and all that. I said, well, it's anonymous. And this is a non-Adventist organization, and I was, I was rebuked, properly rebuked. They said, then how is it a testimony? Good point. I said, what? It's not a testimony if you're not putting your name to it. What are you hiding from? Psalm 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Amen. I said, whoa, okay. 
So I sent it back with a picture, my picture, a picture of my family and the name Victor J. Adams. <laughs> and they published it. Um, but then later, uh, when Sean Boonstra approached me about doing this, I said, you know, I've been praying for the right time to do this and, and the right person to do it with. And if any of you know Sean Boonstra, he says, well, now's the time and I'm the man. <laughs> And he flew me out to California and we filmed the first time and I realized if I'm on TV now, I'm going to have to have a talk with my children. <laughs> my children were like four and five or four and six, something like that. So I sat them down and I told them age appropriately, I told them my story. And then I said, do you have any questions? And Zachary said, no. No. See, they knew me as daddy. They didn't know me as that other person. That other person was dead, see. But Natalie, bless her little heart, she said, So, Dad, you were married to a man? I said, Well, not exactly. I mean, but kind of, sort of, yeah. Well, who is he? And I said, Honey, it doesn't matter who he is. It's nobody you will ever see, you will ever meet. It's long ago and far away. She said, Oh, okay. That was it. My kids grew up knowing me as their dad. My past did not matter to them. It was my present that mattered to them. So anyway, then I started going to ASI conventions and all of that. And I created this big backdrop, you know, pop-up backdrop and, and all of these pictures and things. And across the top I had in bold letters, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And just in case that professor from Andrews ever showed up at ASI, and he never has that I've seen, I had a swatch across the corner saying, Exhibit A. <laughs> I was ready to be Exhibit A if that's what the Lord wanted. And that was... Uh, that was 22, 22, 23 years ago now. But um, that introduction to the 1888 message that long ago had an influence on me. So much of what I heard was what I was preaching because I studied for myself. I was studying to find answers for myself. And what, what D. Casper was presenting today, those quotes from Steps to Christ and Christ's Object Lessons, those are things that I read 30 years ago as a gay person, and I was not offended. I did not think Ellen White was a hate monger or a homophobe. I was saying, praise the Lord, there's hope for me. See, it, it depends on your motive. Uh, where is your heart? Where do you want to be? We find gay people around the world that love our message because they too are seeking answers. They want a way out. Um, but then a large number are very offended and they will petition and they will protest and they will threaten the universities, even like this one, that they will bring in the media, they will use discrimination lawsuits and there's a gay straight alliance on all of our university campuses, which means there are gay people and those who support them that will threaten the universities if someone like I am invited to be on campus, someone like me, um, they will threaten. And then the invitations are withdrawn because the universities are afraid, and we've been told they're afraid of losing their government funding mm -hmm. over a political issue, losing their student loan program, and losing their accreditation, and, and all of that. Um, but so we do have a lot of opposition, and I'll have to say most of our opposition is from within our own Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that alarms me, it saddens me, it sickens me, because what we're hearing here this weekend is a message that most Seventh-day Adventists do not understand. And that's not a critical or judgmental statement, it's just a fact. Uh, they don't. I see it wherever I go. When I share the message I did yesterday, when I share that and these types of messages, there are people that come up to me and say, wow, I've never heard a Seventh-day Adventist sermon like that in years. And I'm preaching from Seventh-day Adventist material. And yet they're not, that's not what they're hearing. And so it's, it's a real honor and a privilege to be able to present you know what the Lord has revealed to me through my experience. Coming out ministries, uh, we have a three-pronged approach. We want to inspire you with our testimonies. We've all come out of 
uh, sexual addiction of one kind or another. Not all homosexuals. Some were straight, but sex addicts, pornography and self-sex and all of those things. Bisexuality, transgenders, we've got, we have it all. And yet they're praising the Lord for salvation from their confusion, from their experience in Babylon. Um, I want to do just a... Um, well, before I go into this, uh, well, a part of what this is about is a short testimony, and Bob is very familiar with this story because um, I was up at his church in Boston. Was it in uh, it was November, December, sometime in that area? And on Friday night, I shared my, my story, my personal story. And there was a fellow sitting maybe four rows back, but he was at the front of the congregation about four rows back, a distinguished young man. He was only 60 years old. <laughs> That's young. Um, no, yeah, it is. Preach it. That's right. But he seemed to be very engaged in the whole presentation. And afterwards, he was the first one. He came up and he wanted to talk to me. And, and he was sharing with me that he really resonated with my story. And um, I picked up immediately uh, his situation to a degree because uh, those of us who have been there, we have what we call gaydar, you know, radar, gaydar. Generally, we can pick up where there is an issue, where someone has been there or is there. It's just because we've been there. Um, and uh, so as we were talking, he said, you know, I have to tell you that I am gay and I... I almost, well, I wanted to confirm that I knew that, but I didn't. That wouldn't be polite. But anyway, he let me know that he was gay. He was married. He had children. He had a son at Loma Linda Medical School. He's a doctor himself and from generations of medical people. Um, a well-known family uh, in where he came from. So I don't like to use his name, but but his story is, is amazing. And... Uh, so he said, I am married and I have children, but I'm also gay. I have a, a boyfriend. And um, he said, funny thing, the other morning I woke up, not with his wife, but he woke up with his boyfriend. And he said, my boyfriend turned to me and he said, so, can you tell me about salvation? And I said, kind of awkward, huh? He said, yeah, you guessed it. Yeah, very awkward. I mean, they're in bed together and the non-Adventist person from the world evidently is someone who is looking for answers. And he knows that this guy is a Seventh-day Adventist. He's a Christian, but he's gay. And he wanted the Adventist gay to tell him about salvation. Imagine the thoughts going through the, the guy's head. And I said, listen... I'm going to be speaking all day tomorrow. Don't miss one of my presentations. He said, I won't. I said, and then we'll talk after that. He was there for the whole day. And that evening, um, as he left, he said, he thanked me for coming. He said, you're going to be hearing from me. Well, I got back to Bob's house, uh, Bob and Andy's house, and you know, you're having afterglow and all this kind of stuff. And it was about, I think it was 11 o'clock when I was cl climbing into bed and my phone dinged. And I looked down and there was a message from this guy. He said I would be hearing from him. I didn't know it'd be that very night. And he, I'm just going to share some of what he shared with me. We've been communicating now ever since and it's gotten rather lengthy. But he said, um, I don't want to read the whole thing. He said, Dear Ron, Eureka! You have shown me the way out. I am held hostage no more. You have no idea what this means and sometime I would like to tell you my story. That very night, and I think it's this message that generated that response. And he goes on to talk about how... Uh, for 41 years, he had been in counseling. And he's a Christian, he's an Adventist, so he's doing Christian counseling about homosexuality. Evidently, he was one of those who didn't want to be gay, but like me, he just accepted who he was. 
That's, that was my excuse and my understanding. For 41 years, he said, I've, I've been in counseling and all of my counseling has been to just learn to love myself. To learn to love myself. He said that was the problem. Yeah. But what you have shown me is that I need to love him Amen. more than myself. Amen. And that, that was the light bulb that went off. He broke up with his boyfriend. He's working to reconcile with his wife. I mean, they were not divorced. They're still living together. But a lot of reconciliation needs to take place. And he said she's very angry. She said, oh, we've been through this route before. It'll never last. And, you know, she's not very supportive, but she's still with him. And um, I said, you know, it's going to take time. 41 years you've been trying to love yourself. It's going to take time for your wife to learn to trust you. You need to just start over. Court her and start over as though she was your high school girlfriend. You know, just start over. Um, so... I am pretty sure that it is this message that was the, that set the light off for this, this fellow. Amen. And so I came up with this message last year after going to the 1888 conference in Loveland, Colorado for the second time in my life. And when I got home after that, I played hooky from church and I, and my wife went to church, but I stayed home. And I sat down, and then this message just kind of flowed. It just came, uh, and I know it had a lot to do with what I learned uh, at the 1888 conference, and, you know, from my own personal study. And, and I'll just say right up front, I'm still learning. You know, I've got a lot to learn. But one way to learn is to share. To share what you do know. And as you do share... You will get corrected along the way. Kelly, be nice to me now. You'll be corrected along the way and, and, and you'll continue to grow. So, anyway, just a little thumbnail sketch of history as just, just as a background. It was in the 1830s that William Miller, a Baptist American, um, began his Adventist message. They didn't call themselves Adventists, but they were labeled as Adventists because they kept preaching Advent. And so these are just a few of those. Dr. Joseph Wolf of Germany, son of a Jewish rabbi. Uh, he became a Christian cons convert when he was very young. Um, Robert Winter of England and hundreds of British pastors of the Church of England began to preach Adventism, the second coming. You know, in light of uh, Daniel 8, 14, um, La Cunza, a Spaniard and Jesuit in South America. He also had a pen name, <laughs> Rabbi Ben Ezra. Who would think he was a Jesuit if he goes by the term rabbi, the title rabbi? Well, that's what Jesuits do. They masquerade, don't they? And he lived in the 18th century, but his book rose to prominence in 1825 and onward in, in time to become a part of the, that um, message. You know, the Feast of Trumpets was a 10-day feast where the trumpets blew to announce the Day of Atonement. And uh, this message started, it went for 10 years. Ellen White says, in trumpet-like tones, it went around the world. Uh, so that's, you know, just a, a bit of our early history. There was Bingle of Germany, 18th century minister of the Lutheran Church. Um, there was um, Gausen of Switzerland, who was a Catholic. The children of Scandinavia um, were teaching Revelation 14 because adults were imprisoned for such preaching, preaching, so the Holy Spirit used the children. We know this story. This is all review. Ellen White and her family were Methodists. Rachel Oaks Preston was a Seventh-day Baptist. Um, and they went through that great disappointment that we all know about in 1844. But these Adventist pioneers, they walked in ever-increasing light. In the beginning, they were Adventists, but they were Sunday keepers, pork eaters, they were smokers, they were from all denominations. They compared the beliefs with Scripture. You know, after the disappointment, they brought their beliefs, you know, like to the table. They compared Scripture with Scripture um, in order to come together in unity of faith, doctrine, and spirit. If it was biblical, they kept it. If they couldn't support it by the Bible, they laid it aside. Um, in the beginning, they were anti-Trinitarian. 
uh, James White was especially anti-Trinitarian from what I understand for years. He eventually got it right before he died. And maybe you know exactly when, how long uh, that was, but, but he did come around eventually. It was in 1863 that the church organized. And then we come to 1888 when there was yet more light. And the reason I show that little history is because these people were growing in the light, uh, just like the Reformation. They didn't all have all the light. They had windows of light, and as they opened these windows of light and put it all together, it became a flood of light and more and more light. Um, and so in 1888, there was more light being revealed. And I really admire Ellen White for recognizing in Jones and Wagoner that the Spirit was giving them a message that they were articulating better than she could herself. I thought, wow, the lady was really humble. She was truly humble. The Lord was going around the prophet to bring a message to the people. She had every opportunity to say, well, wait a minute, God, I'm the prophet. Why aren't you telling me this? But it, she was in harmony with it. She recognized it because it was basically what she believed, but evidently she had not been articulating it up to that point. But then she was used by God to affirm, affirm, affirm all the way through. And they became quite a trio. So the righteousness by faith rather than righteousness by works was being presented and learned. The message was largely rejected by the majority of the leadership at the time. And what I recognized in this was that Ellen White went through another great disappointment. Now, I don't know whether that was brought out in the message, but this is at least is my understanding as I've been listening to the um, Ron uh, Duffield's I've been listening on the CDs to his book because I can't sit down and read. I have to listen while I drive. And, and it just dawned on me that poor lady went through another great disappointment. It seemed like she said it was greater. She, it, it, she was just devastated by all the opposition. So some of the aspects of that message that really resonated with me because these are things that I studied out before coming into the Adventist church that really helped me develop a faith and trust in Jesus. Romans 1, 30, uh, 1 verse 3 about Jesus being made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Romans 8, 3 and 4 that the Son, uh, God sent his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That really resonated with me. Because, you know, when then I could see that Jesus could really understand my struggles. He was made under the law, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, uh, to redeem them that were under the law, which means he was made like us. Um, and this was one of my very favorites, because I see the author of this using words as a highlighter. <laughs> He's underscoring, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise, I mean, look at that. You think he's trying to make a point? <laughs> Took part of the same. I, I, just, I just rejoice every time I read that. He took on him, uh, he took on him the seed of Abraham. You know, people that talk about uh, when they say they use Adam, and I know there's, there's a little bit of, um, I'm not really, really clear on that part because you have the prelapsarian view and the postlapsarian view. But when it says here, he took on him the seed of Abraham, was that prelapsarian or postlapsarian? <laughs> yeah. I think Abraham came along after Adam, so he took on the seed of Abraham the liar, the, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, she is my sister, yeah. Well, it was, it was a half-truth because she was his half-sister. But it wasn't even that uh, because she was his wife, so it's not even a half-truth. But wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. See that underscoring? This is just one of my very favorite passages of Scripture. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or give assistance to those, to them that are tempted. When I went to Brazil several years ago, I was warned about, you know, to be very careful about using certain words and phrases. Like, don't use the phrase, the nature of Christ. 
because you will be ostracized. Um, actually, Doug Batchelor was scheduled to do some meetings there in Brazil, and some, some person was so excited about him coming that they posted on Facebook, I think it was, on social media somewhere, uh, their joy that finally there was someone coming to Brazil that had the correct view of the nature of Christ. <laughs> Doug Bachelor was canceled. He's banned from Brazil. The leadership won't allow him, at least back then. But I was able to go in because I was warned ahead of time. And I never talked about the nature of Christ in those words. But I shared from my story. And the people were rejoicing. They were eating it up. They, I could tell they were seeing Christ in a different light. And I never talked about prelapsarian or postlapsarian or, 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 or use those terms. Um, but while I was there, I was at UNASPI, if you know where that is. It's a university, Adventist University there. There are two campuses. This one campus um, in the middle of a huge orange grove. Um, thousands of students. And I did six presentations there one day and six presentations the next day. The chaplain of the camp, campus chaplain who kind of worked, we worked with to get that set up, he uh, sat down with me between programs and, uh, on the first day. And he said, Ron, I, um, I read your book. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. In your book, you talk about the nature of Christ. I said, um, well, yes, I do. He said, well, you're wrong, you know. I said, I don't think so. And, and I was prepared. Um, he said, well, George Knight says. Mm. And then I said, well, but Ellen White says. <laughs> but George Knight says. And I said, but the Bible says. And we went back and forth. And he said, you know, if you ever plan, are you going to write another book? I said, yes, I, I plan to write another book. He said, well, when you write your next book, you might ought to reverse that position if you ever want to come back to Brazil. Well, I've been back to Brazil several times and I've never reversed the position and I have written the book and it's not in there. But it's amazing that they, he said the official position of the church is prelapsarian. And I said, no, that... That is one view. There are two views, but that's not official. He said, well, in Brazil, it's official. And you need, if you ever want to come back, you need to make that correction. Um, but, you know, I didn't come into the church to compromise on what I believe. Now, I can stand corrected, but I don't want to compromise. Yeah. And so, anyway, this passage just means a great deal to me. Um, we read in manuscript. Uh, 80, Christ assumed our fallen nature and was subject to every temptation to which man is subject. Do you know what that means to a gay person? You know, because gay people are put, uh, they're in a different category. You know, God can do anything with anyone else. But now gay people, no, no. They're born that way. Uh, God himself, God himself can't uh, change them. You know, Satan thinks he's so clever that he can portray, he, he has found one issue where he can portray God as impotent rather than omnipotent. And if we believe he's omnipotent, we can never buy that, that view. We can never drink that Kool-Aid or whatever. We have to see that a gay person needs a savior just like anyone else needs a savior. And Christ assumed our fallen nature, was subject to every temptation to which man is subject. Whatever that means, as a gay person, I can rejoice. Amen. Though Christ had no taint of sin upon his character, yet he condescended to connect our fallen human nature with his divinity. There's a key point. Fallen human nature with divinity. By thus taking humanity, he honored humanity. Having taken our fallen nature, he showed what it might become by accepting the ample provision he has made for it and by becoming partaker of the divine nature. So here he is in divine nature becoming a partaker of fallen human nature. In our fallen human nature, we can become partaker of divine nature. And therefore, the point that's being made to me in Scripture is we can meet Satan on the same grounds that Christ did. That's, that's what, he, he not only is our, 
um, all-sufficient lamb. Uh, he, he's our example. He's our substitute in many ways. He's also our example. I, I liken substitute to justification and example to sanctification, right? Uh, those, there's so many parallels with justification, sanctification, um, and, and you, you, as a Christian, you have to be experiencing both. 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. I have an article that uh, actually uh, inherited an article by another pastor who's now deceased, and I've grown it into what I call a rainbow of promises. And as I read through those promises, I realize I am becoming a partaker of divine nature by reading, by hearing, by believing, by accepting. That's how you become a partaker of divine nature. Uh, here again in Hebrews 4, Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, the text I quoted to the, the professor. Then, I love this one in Our High Calling, page 48. Christ's overcoming and obedience is that of a true human being. In our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that it is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. Amen. His imputed grace and power he gives to all who receive him by faith. And um, I, I love those types of quotes. They, they, I find them very empowering. Uh, the obedience of Christ to his Father was the same obedience that is required of man. Man cannot overcome Satan's temptations without divine power to combine with his instrumentality. That's what Jesus did. He, combined, he depended upon the power from God, the Father, didn't he? And the Holy Spirit uh, to, to resist temptation. So it says, so with Jesus Christ. He could, lay hold, he could lay hold of divine power. He came not to our world to give the obedience of a lesser God to a greater. Don't you love this quote? But as a man to obey God's holy law, and in this way he is our example. The Lord Jesus came to our world not to reveal what a God could do, but what a man could do through faith in God's power to help him in every to help in every emergency. Man is through faith to be a partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is beset. And then it goes on to say, the Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam through faith in Jesus Christ serve him in human nature which we now have. The Lord Jesus has bridged the gulf that sin has made. He has connected earth with heaven and finite man with the infinite God. Jesus, the world's redeemer, could only keep the commandments of God in the same way that humanity can keep them. I find that extremely encouraging because his example is, you know, in, in Revelation, in the title of the presentation, to them that overcome, even as I also overcame. And here we see it. He could only do it the way we can do it. So, and, and what we're going to look at is how Jesus, how Jesus dealt with temptation and was a complete overcomer and then apply that to us so, so we can do the same thing. We are not to serve God as if we were not human, but we are to serve Him in the nature we have that has been redeemed by the Son of God. Through the righteousness of Christ, we shall stand before God pardoned and as though we had never sinned. Have we heard that this weekend? <laughs> when I heard the presentations today, I said, oh my word, they're taking all of my seminar material. <laughs> and uh, so, who was it that said, by repetition? It sticks by repetition. So we're going to get some repetition, right? Well, I mean, every Sabbath, don't we hear some repetition when we go to church? The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. 
So, Jesus, tempted in all points like is me, and I like to make it personal, yet without sin. And I have to say, how is that possible? Have you ever wondered, how is it possible that he could be tempted like me, yet without sin? So, we're going to look at that. In Luke 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And this is our jumping off point. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So where was his focus? When he was battling Satan and temptation, where was his focus? He was focusing on you, focusing on me. I like to think, hmm, 2,000 years ago, my name was on his mind. What is that song? While he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Yeah, isn't that neat? I, I, I like to think that. He came to seek and to save Ron Woolsey that was lost. You know, with God, he never says, I was, or I will be. Well, I shouldn't say never. He says, I am. So when he says, I am, that means he, he was very aware of my present today and, and my past and all of that. Um, this thing just keeps popping up about trying to log in. Um, the point of this is that his love for me was greater than his love for sin or temptation to sin. And I heard that today already, that his love for us was greater than his love for himself. And that's what I get out of, out of these verses of Scripture. The power of Jesus' love for me far exceeded the power of Satan to tempt me. John 4, verse 4, For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. All right? And God is love. So greater is love than hate. Mm -hmm. We'll look at that some more. I, I'm going to keep pointing that out. Jesus' love for me was so great that he could not be distracted by temptation to sin. So when I see uh, Jesus in the wilderness of temptation, and Satan is saying, if thou be the Son of God, you know, da -da -da -da, Jesus says, in my words, he says, don't distract me. Get behind me. I'm on a mission. He would not be distracted because he was not focused on self. Right? And Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Have we heard that today and yesterday of our faith? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. What was that joy that was before him? The joy of being with me and you, and those he loves for all eternity. Amen. There's no greater love than this. John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. There we get, again we see the selfless focus. His focus was on you. His focus was on me. It was not upon his, himself. Satan had no power over Jesus, because I believe all temptation appeals to self. Amen. And if you are not self-focused, doesn't temptation lose its power? And when you think about the LGBT issue, have you ever seen any community more self-focused anywhere? The gay pride parades. I mean, parading, parading around... If straight people were to parade around the way they do, they'd be arrested for their, I started to say for their dress, no, for their lack of dress, for the, the exposure and the lewd behavior that they have. Um, it, it's just amazing, this self-focus. And, you know, I read about three sins especially offensive to God. Pride, mm -hmm. selfishness, and covetousness. And I used to wonder about that. Why are they so, you know, why isn't homosexuality especially offensive? He calls it abomination, but have you ever seen the list of abominations in the Bible? <laughs> uh, homosexuality is not the abomination, 
it's an abomination. Mm -hmm. It's one of many. But it's not listed in the three sins especially offensive to God. And I think I alluded to this yesterday. These sins are so offensive to God because they were, first of all, they're, they're not readily seen in the person's heart. Have you ever seen a humble person that turned out to be proud of his humility? <laughs> right. There are people that are so humble and they're proud of it. They want you to admire them for their humility. You know, pride can be something that is very private and secret and it can be festering in the dark, you know, and selfishness. Look at what Lucifer did in heaven. And, you know, when you went through that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, what Lucifer did in heaven, he was pretending to be supportive of God the Father and trying to improve on perfection <laughs> of heaven. So, pride and covetousness, desiring that which belongs to someone else or desiring that which is off limits, that God has forbidden. And those three sins made a devil out of Lucifer. And that's why I think they're especially offensive to God because so many sins are open and very easy to see, especially in you, right? It's easy to see. When I say you, I'm talking about other than myself. It's easy to see the faults of other people. Mm -hmm. And usually when you see the faults in other people, you're really projecting because you don't want to see that same thing in yourself. So you have to be careful about pointing out a specific sin in someone else because that's might be a revela revelation to others about your own secret life and what have you. Um, so these are very offensive to God and we see that so alive and well in the LGBT community. But God laid down his life for gay people just as well as for anyone else. We read here God is love, God is omnipotent, and, and I like equations. I was, I was amused by Jerry Fenneman's equations today. That was so clever. I was trying to write them down. I finally said, no, I just have to take pictures. because I cannot keep up with that guy. Um, but God is love and God is omnipotent. So his perfect love exceeds the supernatural powers of Satan, temptation, and sin. The power of love exceeds the power of hate. Because God is love and he's omnipotent. Satan is hateful, but he's not omnipotent. So that to me is a very big key. And I alluded to that yesterday when we talked about the broad way and the narrow way. Going down the broad way, you may be propelled by supernatural energy of the devil. But you have omnipotent energy throwing roadblocks all along the way. Going up the narrow way, you may have supernatural roadblocks all along the way, but you're propelled by omnipotence. And so it does make sense. After all of these years, I kind of agree now with Wheeland that it's easier to be saved than lost. I you know, that's the thing that turned me away from the 1888 message in the beginning because I said, yeah, right. It's a lot easier to coast downhill than to climb up a mountain. The guy is, doesn't know what he's talking about. And I, you know, that one thing just really stuck in my craw until I gave it a thorough second look. And I said, uh, that's right out of the Bible and right out of the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> so anyway, so when we see the power of love exceeds the power of hate, and the question is, so now how am I to overcome sin? And, and this is where we make application to the example that Christ has given us, and we make it to ourselves and share with others. Um, Revelation 3.21, To Laodicea, Jesus said to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. To me, uh, I mean, you can read that several ways. It's saying, I overcame, and if you overcome, you can sit with me in my throne. But I like to read it, even as I did overcome the way I did. That's what I see in that. So, let's see what the Word tells us about that. Philippians 2, 5, verse 8, First of all, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Do you see 
where he's going here, he was not self-focused. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Bob, was it you that pointed out yesterday that, that Satan, wanting to be like God, was overlooking that to be like God was to be humble? Didn't that come from you? And this is where, where you see that. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that, that is very profound. But why didn't I see that the first time I read it? You know, uh, when you study the Word of God, every time you read something, don't you see something deeper? It has deeper, more precious meaning. So if my love for Jesus exceeds that of love of self and love of sin, then I too can be an overcomer. That's the bottom line. That, you know, how do you get there? When my focus is no longer on self first, again, temptation loses its power. Is that logical? Um, Again, I, I just keep thinking of Jesus, God's invitation in Isaiah 1. Come now, let us reason together. And as I read these texts of Scripture and I just apply logic, this is what I come up with. If my focus is no longer on self, then temptation loses its power. By beholding Him, now where is my focus? On Him. I will be changed into His image with his love for God supremely and his love for others ahead of himself and uh, ahead of myself if I stay focused on him. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me where I am asked to love God supremely and my neighbors myself. Jesus loved me more than eternal life for himself. His love for his Father first and for me, kept him from yielding to temptation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, I, <coughs> I picture Jesus this way, <coughs> with a laser-like focus upon those whom he sought to save. So when he was tempted, as I mentioned earlier, he would say, get thee behind me, Satan. Don't distract me. You're in the way. Get out of the way. Right? My laser-like focus must then be upon Jesus, my Savior from sin. I picture it like a lifeguard. In one of my presentations, I use that illustration of someone drowning in the sea. People, uh, people are always asking, well, why, how did that person become gay? Was he born that way? Did, was he conditioned to be that way? Was this, that, and all these reasons. Why is he gay? They're, they're, their focus is on the wrong thing. The Bible doesn't focus so much on why a person is in sin. The Bible focuses on the solution. So I use the illustration of someone drowning in the sea. The lifeguard comes out, but before rescuing him, he starts asking questions. How'd you get here? I mean, you're way out from this shore. Did you get caught in a riptide? Are you trying to set a swimming distance record? Did someone push you off a boat? You know, you go through all these questions and the poor, you can see people turning blue while, <laughs> while we're going through all these questions and the poor drowning victim, glub, glub, glub. You know, the lifeguard doesn't care, does he? He is not interested in how you got into that situation. He is simply there to save you from it. That, to me, is such a powerful illustration. So, but in order to save that victim, uh, if, if the lifeguard is reaching to the victim, the victim needs to reach back to the lifeguard. Now, if the victim is unconscious, it's different. But, you know, no illustration is perfect. But, far. no, yeah, don't take it too far. But this is a victim who's trying to explain why he's there. So, okay, he, he can still reach out. So... If, if the victim does not cooperate, his chances of being saved are, are lessened, minimized. And some victims will struggle with the lifeguard to where the lifeguard has to hit him over the head and <laughs> to get his attention or to knock him out so he can save his life, you know. Um, so if, if I am drowning in the sea of sin, 
it doesn't really matter why, does it? What matters is where's the lifeguard. And if my focus will be on the lifeguard, then, uh, you know, keeping that laser-like focus upon Jesus, my Savior from sin, then the temptations of Satan are lessened. With that kind of focus, temptation should lose its power. I'm not focused upon self, but upon Christ. Not upon self-satisfaction, but Christ's favor. Not upon self-esteem, but Christ's reputation. Mm -hmm. I'm using phrases that are very familiar with me when, from my years in the gay life, okay? Not upon self-advancement, but Christ's advancement and His cause. Not upon self-gratification, but upon Christ's pleasure. Not upon self-glorification, but the glory of Christ in and through myself. It's a totally different focus. Revelation 12, 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And then notice, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now we've already looked at Hebrews chapter 4, that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 2, he suffered being tempted um, or struggled. And anyone that's ever worked out in a gym knows that struggle is good. If you're not struggling against temptation, then you're probably yielding to temptation, right? Struggle makes you strong. You know, when you're working out in a gym, I, I remember the days when I used to do that. <laughs> Believe it or not, I used to do that. Um, doing a bench press. You know, if you have a, a coach or a buddy, a, a gym partner, uh, sometimes you want to smack him, but you've got too much weight over your head. And so you're you're doing the bench press, and you're pushing and pushing, and you get to where, you, oh, you're done. And he says, no, 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 one more, right? <laughs> okay, one more. And you struggle, and you get up there, and this is where you start wanting to smack him. One more. And he keeps saying, one more. And surprisingly, you end up doing like five more than you would have done there than you wanted to do, and you really want to smack him, but you're too occupied. Then you get to the point where you're getting up there saying, he said one more and you're up there and you just cannot get it. And I've seen this happen where he will reach over and just put his hand on the barbell, just touch it, and you go the rest of the way. Now, God does not leave us alone in our struggle. Jesus suffered being tempted and he struggled, but he was never alone. He always had the power of the Holy Spirit, the encouragement. Remember, the angels came and encouraged him and all that kind of thing. They were there to help him, to, to strengthen him, to encourage him to go forward. And so, um, we see here that the word of their testimony, they loved not their lives unto the death. And I think, I don't know that I'm there. I don't know that I could choose to die rather than sin. How about you? Are you there? The point is, has anyone else ever done that? We read in Hebrews 12, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus did. Has anyone else ever done that? Yes. Millions of martyrs. They probably didn't wake up one morning and think, well, I'm going to be a martyr today. We're not faced with that today. But God says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And he also says, my grace is sufficient. I don't need a martyr's grace today. But if I ever do, I have assurance that it's there. Amen. Right? God's grace is sufficient for the evil that you're faced with. So I try not to think about being a martyr. I mean, you can think, you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and, and to me, I think you could lose your faith over that thing. Well, I just, I can't go through that, can't go through that. Well, you're not asked to go through that. Not yet. But if you do have to go through it, 
God's grace is there. Remember the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. They were not saved from it. They were saved in it. And you think, wasn't it Huss that went to his, the stake singing and he sang until he died? That tells me that God's grace is sufficient. Maybe he didn't feel the pain or maybe he did feel the pain, but his strength was greater than the pain. You know, when I was a little kid, the first time I stubbed my toe, I wailed and cried like I was going to die. My mama thought that I was on, about to die. You know? <laughs> but I'm an adult now and I can stub my toe and I can just say, ouch. It still hurt, but it's not the end of my life. And I think about, you know, Ellen White says there are Enochs in this our day. Have you ever read that? Our professor at Little Creek Academy, I wonder if he was one of those Enochs. He, in his younger days, was a redhead. I mean, I could tell by his complexion that he'd been a redhead. And so, and then I heard that he, you know, really did have quite a fiery temper to overcome as a young person. But everybody admired Prof. Straw, Leland Straw. He was such an admirable character. And um, it's like we boys were always waiting to catch him doing something that was wrong. <laughs> no, to slip up and say a bad word or something. And one day, a bunch of guys were helping roof one of the buildings. And Prof. Straw came down with a hammer and he hit the wrong nail. He hit his thumb. And all the guys are going, <gasps> they were waiting for this redhead to blurt out something improper. And he just kind of blinked and said, oh, how unpleasant. <laughs> and we go, what? How unpleasant? Oh, come on. You know, uh, you know he, he was such a godly man. And, and everyone just really, really loved that man. Um, I don't even know how I got on that story. But, you know, you resist. And, uh, oh, the story is that God's grace is sufficient. Amen. You know, um, you can endure things now in your growth that you could hardly endure when you were a child. And I think it's the same way, uh, this way. Jesus resisted under blood. And, um, and we have ev ample evidence that any one of us can do the same thing. Even today in parts of the world, Christians that do not have the 1888 message, they do not have the light that we have, and yet they're dying rather than denying their Savior. They have perfect hearts, right? God looks upon them. If they're willing to resist under blood, to die rather than betray the Lord, and we're talking about little children over there in the Middle East. These people are threatening the parents. If you don't you know, recant or whatever, we'll kill your children. And, and in front of you. And they just tell their children, be faithful. And they martyr the children in front of the parents. And the children don't recant either. These little children refuse to deny Jesus Christ. God's grace is sufficient. That gives me great comfort. Amen. And I like this quote about the secret to overcoming sin. And you can see it's a, a commentary from Revelation 12:11. We become overcomers by helping others to overcome. How? By the blood of the Lamb, the story of Jesus. We tell people about the story of Jesus. And the word of our testimony. The keeping of the commandments of God will yield in us an obedient spirit and the service that is the offspring of such a spirit God can accept. I used to wonder about that, the word of our testimony. And then I realized anyone could tell the story of Jesus. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and his ministers into ministers of righteousness. So you have ministers that are actually, actually under the influence of Satan that are preaching the gospel all over the world. And, and hundreds of people come weeping to the altar to give their hearts to Jesus. What's the word of their testimony? When they're confronted with the law of God, you know, a lot of these ministers say, well, don't worry about the law. It was nailed to the cross. Jesus did it all. You know, it doesn't apply to you, you know. And so the word of their testimony. What is Satan's testimony? Does he demonstrate through word or deed the power of Jesus Christ to save from sin? No. So the word of our testimony is very, very important. And I want to, uh, to uh, end the presentation. And then I found out two people have already referred to this today. <laughs> Gethsemane and Desire of Ages. 
You didn't hear it, did you? Didn't any of you hear it? Stealing your material. What? Stealing your material. I know. <laughs> they read my notes. I left my... Anya, you had my computer yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm taking notes from Ellen White in Desire of Ages. It's worth reading again. And I, I want to just read excerpts from this chapter because when you see, this shows how focused Jesus was on you and on me and the struggle. And if you've heard it twice today already, three times is a charm, right? Third time is a charm. As Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature, he would be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. You know, he had a real human struggle, didn't he? If Christ could be overcome, the earth would become Satan's kingdom and the human race would be forever in his power. With the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread. Notice what the dread was. Not the pain, but of separation from God. Satan told him that if he became the surety of a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. And didn't we just hear already today that he did not feel so much the pain as this sense of separation? And he felt in his humanity that it could be eternal. He would be identified with Satan's kingdom and would never more be one with God. I, I can hardly relate to this because I, uh, well, he's realizing it's his human nature, but this, this uh, struggle is just beyond really human, my human con uh, contemplation. And what was to be gained by this sacrifice? How hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men. In its hardest features, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you. They are seeking to destroy you. The foundation, the center and seal of the promises made to them as a peculiar people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities, will betray you. Hmm. There's a third reference to this. I mean, D. Casper actually pointed that out with John 14, 1 to 3. He said, what happened just before John 14, 1 to 3? Jesus warned Peter about his failure, but he gave him a promise anyway. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. That's the one. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being abhorred the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. Remember, his whole laser-like focus was on his mission of redemption. And Satan is there to say, it's worthless, it's pointless. They're not going to accept it. They're betraying you. They're denying you. They're rejecting you. And, and here he was willing to give up his own eternal life for those people who were rejecting him. The conflict was terrible. Its measure was the guilt of his nation, of his accusers and betrayer, the guilt of a world lying in wickedness. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ and the sense of God's wrath against sin was crushing out his life. <clears throat> so behold him contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. Now we have a price on our heads. He came to save me. He came to save you. And the price, I mean, if you've ever wondered about self-value and self-worth, look at the price God has put on you. And he's contemplating that price. In his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn farther from God. From his pale lips comes a bitter cry, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet even now, he adds, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Where was his focus? God first, your will, and second, you and me. 
The human heart longs for sympathy and suffering. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being, in the supreme agony of his soul. He came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those whom he had so often blessed and comforted and shielded in sorrow and distress. The one who had always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony. And he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. And here it is. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. That was a temptation. A terrible temptation. If he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated this, he would be strengthened. Do we encourage Christ when he looks at us? Are we encouraging him that his sacrifice was worth it? Or are we adding to this, this suffering that he went through? He went to his disciples, but he found them asleep. So then again, the Son of God was seized with superhuman agony, fainting and exhausted. He staggered back to the place of his former struggle. His suffering was even greater than before. As the agony of soul came upon him, his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. A short time before, Jesus had stood like a mighty cedar. Now he was like a reed beaten and bent by the angry storm. He had approached the consummation of his work, a conqueror. Now had come the hour of the power of darkness. Now his voice was heard on the still evening air, not in tones of triumph. Where do we next hear his tone of triumph? Yeah. But from this moment up until his last breath, there was no tone of triumph, but full of human anguish. The words of the Savior were borne to the ears of the drowsy disciples. Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. The first impulse of the disciples was to go to him, but he had bidden them tarry there, watching under prayer. When Jesus came to them, he found them still sleeping. Turning away, Jesus sought again his retreat and fell prostrate, overcome by the horror of a great darkness. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not now for his disciples that their faith might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. The awful moment had come, that moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Remember, he was on a mission, and he was focused. <clears throat> but the fate of humanity trembled in the balance. And this, to me, is so powerful. Christ might even now refused to drink the cup apportioned to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his iniquity. These are all tempting thoughts. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his sin and I will go back to my father. Will the Son of God drink the bitter cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the consequences of the curse of sin to save the guilty? The words fall tremblingly from the pale lips of Jesus. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Three times has he uttered that prayer. <clears throat> Three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, <clears throat> must perish. This is where I insert myself. I see him looking down through the ages, and he sees me. And he sees that if I am left to myself, I will perish. He sees my helplessness. He sees the power of sin, the woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. 
He beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. And he is our example. Does he deserve our love? Does he deserve our gratitude? I mean, when you read this, and it's, it's hard to comment on it because she does it perfectly. <laughs> He accepts his baptism of blood that through him perishing millions, including Ron Woolsey, may gain everlasting life. Amen. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory to save the one lost sheep. And I could put my name in there, but it goes on to say the one world that has fallen by transgression. His sacrifice was for the whole world. And he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propiti propitiation of a race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. I just think if I could only say that every time I'm tempted, God, your will be done. And I learned something else today that our, you know, when we read in, um, in James, submit yourself therefore to God and then resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's not a one-time submission at baptism or, or conversion. It's not a one-time-a-day submission. It may not be once an hour. In other words, we need to be in a state of mind of submission at all times. We can be in that state of mind of submission at all times. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we are better able to resist. He will not turn from his mission. If we could just think, thy will be done at all times. And then education, page 263. And I got this out of a little book, about 10 things or something from the 1888 message. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Savior. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony. It was not just Jesus suffering. You know, if you are a parent, now think about those people in the Middle East where their children are being martyred in front of them. Who is suffering more? The parents. The agony of the parents watching their children being tortured and martyred and so it wasn't just Jesus that suffered, though he suffered immensely. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony. But that suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. This was something that just really blew my mind last year. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from his very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. That's just a window, a one-day window of what God has been going through for thousands, well, from its inception, since the fall of Lucifer. God the Father, God the Godhead, has been suffering immensely. I think his capacity for suffering is measured by his capacity for love. And then he just says in response, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's demonstrated his love for us. And now he says, will you love me? If you love me, keep my commandments. He's our substitute. He's our example. He's our savior. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I really think that this is what flipped the switch with the doctor in New York. He said he drove 500 miles for that event when his friend called and said that I was going to be there. It's not because of me. It's because he was looking for answers and he heard that it was going to be talked about in Boston. He'd never heard of me before. But I tell you what, I had a hard time going to sleep after 11 o'clock that night <laughs> when he responded, Eureka, I am held hostage no longer. <clears throat> and I think it was revealing this struggle that Jesus had that his laser-like focus was what kept him in line. And if we could just do the same. 
then then we will be more successful in our battles. Any questions before we close? Oh, it's it's overtime. Do I get paid time and a half? For <laughs> no, do you get paid time and a half? <clears throat> I guess we have no time for questions. It's time to, unless there is an urgent need for one. Let's stand and we'll have a closing prayer. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, as we have contemplated today the immense sacrifice that you and your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and all of heaven made that I might have eternal life, that we might have eternal life. It's just more than we can really comprehend. But we can appreciate it. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to keep this foremost in our minds that the way Jesus was able to resist and overcome all temptation was by staying focused on his mission of love. Love for you first, love for us, the object, the focus of his mission. And Lord, we just need to ask that you will help us to to do the same in reverse, to keep our focus upon you. We, we are victims of Satan's onslaught each and every day and all day long. And as I review this material myself, I realize that, that like Jesus, I can, I can also say with your power, your grace, don't distract me, get thee behind me, not interested in your thoughts and your temptations. I'm on a mission, I'm focused, and I'm beholding my Savior. Lord, help us to stay focused so that we too can be victors. And in this theater of your grace, in which the whole universe is watching, your plan of salvation play out. May we be a part of those who live to bring glory to you and to vindicate your name and your character before the world, before angels, and before men, before the universe. I pray in Jesus' name.